Uh, junipers, pinion pines. We're in the Great Basin. Hey everybody, welcome back to Let's Go Geo. I'm Heather, your geo guide, and today we find ourselves in the Great Basin in Nevada. I'm up here climbing this mountain because we're on the hunt for fossils today. <laughs> ourselves in the basin and range so I'm on this mountain but if you look out there you see immediately a valley and then another mountain and if we could keep going we would find this repeated pattern of valley mountain valley mountain or the basin and range the basin and range formed from extensional forces and extensional forces tend to form these valleys with the mountains and then the mountains on each side are bounded typically by normal faults. If you look on any map and you observe the topography, especially in a place like here in Nevada, you'll quickly see that basin and range looking almost like a stripe pattern. Actually, Dutton described it as something like caterpillars crawling out of Mexico, which it's kind of what it looks like, I suppose. Pretty big caterpillars. And those caterpillars tend to trend approximately north-northeast. So if we were to go back eh, several hundred million years ago, here we would be standing, actually we'd be floating in an ancient sea. The ancient seaway laid down all of this marine sediment and marine animals in those seas were trapped in those sediment layers for a very long time. Remember, the continents at this time were not where we think of them as being today. And this deposited what we know of as the Paleozoic sedimentary units, many of which cover much of Western North America. Limestone, dolomite, some shales, sandstones, later got altered to metasedimentary rocks, quartzites, marbles. There was lots of action going on on the west coast of North America. This caused orogenies, or mountain building events. The Sonoma, Antler, Laramide orogenies. And intrusions, especially of granitic plutons and related volcanic dikes and sills pushed into the existing rock. Volcanic arcs formed, plates got smashed into other plates, think Juan de Fuca and Farallone plates. Flood basalts, think of eastern Washington and Oregon. Hotspot activity, think Yellowstone. Ignimbrites, those massive volcanic eruptions in the Cenozoic that we actually just talked about from some cool examples here in Nevada. Then more recently, there was even a bit more volcanic activity. Those basins at one point filled with water during the glacial periods and that deposited lacustrine sediments or lake deposits. These regions later dried as you can see the one down there, but you can kind of also see remnants of where there might have been water sitting. These dry basins now are our playas and these are regions where we can now find things like halite, trona, even lithium, and now sometimes solar farms. And of course, all the while this was happening, volcanism, extension, all these different deposits being laid down and being intruded and accompanying fault formation. As you can expect, all of this caused some changes to whatever was already existing. Thrust faults pushed older strata on top of younger stuff. That's not what we'd expect if this stuff was left undisturbed, but it does make interpreting it in the field a challenge. Molten rock also came into contact with this existing material, say like the carbonates around me, the dolomites and limestones. If a Mesozoic pluton pushed up and intruded these carbonate rocks, we might end up with some highly sought after ores of gold, lead, zinc, silver, stuff like that. And indeed, we do find that in this area. These magmas can also serve as a source of heat for hydrothermal activity, leading to sulfide deposits nearby Scarn and tungsten. Contact metamorphism from intrusions. If you say have some siliceous dolomite that gets intruded by a gabbro, you might get talc, such as the case in the Death Valley region. So as you can see, much of the ingredients for today's highly sought after minerals were all culminating hundreds of millions of years ago when little unknowing sea creatures were walking or swimming around ancient seas in the Paleozoic. And that also makes for some great fossil collecting. Whew. It's getting toasty already. Good thing we started early. 
at this. Tons of marine creatures that were once darting around in a Paleozoic sea hundreds of millions of years ago. Wow, and look at this one. It actually even still has a shell intact. That's amazing. Oh, lots of little whirls like this. These whirls are one turn of a coil in a marine snail shell. Most gastropods have pretty heavy duty shells that actually aren't that easily physically broken, but chemically, they're typically made up of aragonite. Aragonite is a calcium carbonate mineral similar to calcite, but it breaks down more easily. So what we end up left with are actually just the internal skeleton casts and molds of those once living shells. In the Paleozoic, seaways covered much of North America. It was actually pretty tropical, especially in Western North America and places like here in Nevada, places that are high and dry today. This was probably due to that warmer climate and possibly increased rates of seafloor spreading. So we can find marine fossils like this all across North America, like here in Nevada, of course, but all the way also into places even like Iowa. Just check out this fossil that I found in an ancient seaway that covered Iowa. In Western North America, we find basement rocks that can be made up of these Paleozoic carbonates. These then would be the oldest rock units in the area or in the mountain range. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic and I love teaching and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience but digitally so Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well but I have a lot of great other ideas so if you want to help me out support me and help the project move along you can find me on Patreon and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. In these Paleozoic layers, we're covering a long period of time from roughly almost 600 million years ago to about 250 million years ago. The end of which marks a pretty traumatic extinction episode here on Earth, often referred to as the Great Dying because so much sea life went extinct. Here in the Paleozoic ancient sea deposits, we can find animals that no longer live today because they did go extinct. And that includes things like trilobites and ammonites, two of the most popular ones. There are also corals, the tabular type, horn corals, bryozoans, brachiopods, and bivalves, and crinoids. Aside from that, great dying extinction at the end of the Permian, at the end of the Paleozoic, we also see some extinction events at, say, the end Ordovician and end Devonian. Extinction events like this are probably caused by climate changes, sometimes changes in the tectonics and volcanism, sometimes changes in oxygenation, probably a combination of all of those factors. But these are events that happened over many millions of years, not just, say, decades, even centuries. This is what climate scientists mean when they refer to our current climate change as being very rapid as compared to, say, these geologically historic climate change events. Decades and centuries versus many millions of years. Huh, there's a nice trilobite right there. Look at that. This could actually help us determine the age of this stuff too, which this is likely Ordovician age. Trilobites were very common at the beginning of the Paleozoic in the Cambrian on into the Ordovician, and throughout the Paleozoic. That's why we often find them in marine deposits, limestones, shales, and those types of Paleozoic units. They walked across the bottom of these ancient seas, so we'd expect them in units with these uh, ancient substrate deposits. Also, in combination with these other marine forms like these bivalves, probably not too far from their food sources and 
tubes and burrows left behind. The beginning of the Paleozoic starts with that Cambrian, and this is often coined an explosion of life. In reality, much of the precursors of these life forms probably already started to exist. And we have those interesting anomalies, like the Ediacaran fauna. But in general, we do see this kind of explosion in the marine fossils in these deposits. Body forms, much of which we still have today. In that way, it pretty much set the stage for life for the next hundreds of millions of years. What were the causes of this? Well, probably something like that free oxygen, also the calcium that could be used for shell making, and for, for one reason or another, evolutionary changes that cause these new body forms and probably also some predator-prey arms races going on. Either way, this all led to a heightened diversity of life forms that we find here. In the early to mid-Paleozoic, much of Western North America teemed with these trilobites and other marine life forms on a carbonate platform environment. Here's another trilobite that I found here. Oh, this is a great sample. I love this one. Unfortunately, there's a little crack across there, but you can see a lot of body form there. Trilobites are arthropods, so they shed their exoskeleton, or they molt. As a result, we tend to be able to find a lot of their body impressions remaining in these marine deposits from the Paleozoic. Trilobites, like this guy, were once some of the main predators in those Paleozoic seas, but believe it or not, trilobites are extinct now. I hope you guys enjoyed our tour of the ancient Paleozoic seas and our fun fossil hunting adventure. We found some good ones today. Hope you guys will join me on the next Geo Adventure here at Let's Go Geo. We have a lot more fun to come from this area. Fossil hunting, mineral hunting, all things Geo. See you guys in the next adventure. Mm -hmm.